We are so thrilled to be here today with Radhi Devlaki Shetty, who is our September cover girl. Hey Radhi! Hi, I'm so grateful to be here with you and um, yeah, so excited, I really appreciate it. Oh, we are so thrilled to have <laughs> you. You bring such good energy to, to Coco Eco uh, for September, so oh, thank you. Thank you. Now, I want to know all about you. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about your inspiration in life. Wow, okay, my inspiration. So, um, inspirations for many different parts of my life, I feel I have. So, when it comes to the thing that I did the most, which is cooking, <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of my inspiration has come from my heritage. So, whether it's uh, India, where my grandparents were born, or Africa, where my parents were born, I feel like there's a lot of fusion between um, those two worlds, plus the way that I was brought up in London, and then I moved to America. So, I feel like actually inspiration ends up coming from my journey through my life plus the experience of my family which has been infused into my life as I've grown up. Now tell me quickly about your family. Yeah, um, uh, so my grandparents were born in India as I said and then they moved to Africa. My grandma and my granddad were actually teachers so they moved to Africa to teach in, uh, to teach there and my grandma was also a dance teacher and she used to teach which was so beautiful to see because at that time she was teaching African children how to do Indian dancing and, and they were merging the two cultures so beautifully. Um, and then my, my mom was born there, my dad was also born obviously separately somewhere else um, but in Africa too and um, then my parents ended up coming to London and uh, they met there <laughs> and then I was born um, but yeah so that's my that's my family kind of background it's a mix of um, and even the language that I end up speaking is a mix between like Gujarati but also Swahili which is spoken in Africa too so there's a mix of the two languages that I was brought up speaking a rich blend of heritage yeah it's amazing yeah it really is and I really think a lot of I was so lucky that I got so much of that culture brought into my life from a young age like my, my parents really made such a conscious effort that because I was being brought up in London although I very much so relate to London culture and British culture I think um, it's been such a beautiful thing for me to be able to experience my parents' heritage too and have that as part of me and my identity. Mm. Now you're very close to your parents. I am. I genuinely speak to them. I'm not joking. I will speak to my parents a minimum of three times a day. Oh my gosh. And if I don't, my mom will be like, where have you been? You've only called me once today. And I'm like, I know, I was so busy. But every time I tell people that, like, you talk to her three times a day. I'm like, yeah, I am cooking my breakfast when she's cooking her lunch. So we call each other while we're cooking. Um, and then I'm cooking my dinner, I'm cooking my lunch while she's cooking her dinner or something like that. But we're always on the phone to each other. I call her for everything and she's actually become one of my bestest friends. So, and my dad's always there. He's like the gentle, sweet soul in the background. He's always listening um, and inputs when, um, when he wants to tell a joke, which is always great. Mm, that's so sweet. <laughs> yeah, and my grandma is definitely a huge, she's probably my favorite person in the whole entire world. And she just has the most vibrant, loving kind. Anybody who meets her feels this deep loving energy and I genuinely think it's come from her spiritual practice. Like she's had the most incredible devoted spiritual practice her whole life without fail. Like there's no doubt in her mind, no question in her mind of what comes first. It's her spirituality and, and it really shines through her so deeply um, and so wise to so many people around her. Now with your family and all of this heritage and all of this love and closeness, um, how has that impacted your life um, in the sense of your joy of cooking and food? And mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if I think about the recipes that I love to create, it's always a really great balance between Western and Eastern food. Um, and I really try to fuse a lot of them together because I think, you know, we're all in such a multicultural society that actually fusion food and really introducing people to the food that I'm used to in my house, like we're used to Indian food five days a week and that's what I grew up on. But being able to bring that with food that you know is, is more common in Western cultures, it's so beautiful to be able to bring the spices and the healing properties of them into the food that you're used to here. Um, and I really think that's been probably my favorite thing to do. It's like I'll make a burger, but it will be an Indian spiced burger with Indian chutneys and, and, um, and 
flavours in it, which I think is uh, very welcomed here now, which is yeah, nice definitely. to see. Yeah, definitely. Definitely cute and a bit more exciting. Yeah. Um, now, also, you're an Ayurvedic health counsellor, yes. correct? Very recently, just became one a couple of months ago. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Now, how did you get inspired to study that and become certified in that in that way? Yeah, I um, always loved food. I actually trained as a dietitian and nutritionist when I was at university. And then I ended up having to move to New York because of my husband's work. And when I moved there, I actually wasn't able to work at the time. And I really was trying to figure out who I was there and what I wanted to do. And I started um, learning more about Ayurveda in New York, actually, because um, I found this teacher who's incredible. Her name is Divya Alta. She's got an Ayurvedic restaurant in New York. And I just started saying to her, you know what? I would love to just learn about Ayurveda. I'll be your assistant, like whatever you need. Let me just come and help you. And so I started helping her out. I became her sous chef or whatever it was that I would call it. And I just started learning so much from her. And she's so authentic in her practice. And I just fell in love with it because it was the first time I understood, I, it was the first time I felt like I had found a practice that incorporates body, mind and soul as part of wellness. Um, but not only that, I really felt that it, it talks about the individual and that's what I love about Ayurveda. Ayurveda means life and Veda means knowledge. And it's literally that, it teaches you about the knowledge of life that you need to keep your body, mind and soul uh, at, at its optimum. And it's very individual, which was my favorite part about it because for me, it doesn't make sense for, for me and you, for example, our body types are so different. Our minds are so different. So how can it make sense that when we both have a cold that we both end up taking the same thing? For example, um, our, you know, just like our genes, we have genes, but they're so different. In the same way in Ayurveda, it talks about our bodies are composed of elements. And so even though we have the same elements, the elemental composition is, will be completely different. And so our reaction to our environment, our reaction to food will be very different. And so I really loved how it's very individual with its treatment, individual with the way that it um, observes and analyzes the body to be able to treat it and to be able to heal it. And I just, and on top of that, it's all based on what nature provides. And I thought as soon as I heard that, I was like, it just makes sense. How can we, whatever we are born into, whatever we have around us, there has to be, as, as much as we can cause harm to our body through those things, there has to be the availability of things in the world that can heal us also. It's just a matter of being able to understand our bodies and understand the things around us to know how they can heal and how they can harm us. So do you believe that um, Ayurveda can help us with our immune system, which is such an important question right, right now, now? especially, yeah, definitely. And I always talk about, I think, you know, there's a lot of things that everybody says, like turmeric and, and these wellness shots. And sometimes I just think, you know, there are always going to be fads that come out of things that are, are, that are good for you at the time. And then sometimes the uh, news shows us that actually it was really bad for you. It's like, avocado is amazing. Oh, wait, avocados, there's a lot of fat in them, so don't eat them. Oh, coconut oil is amazing. Wait, 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 there's a lot of saturated fat in coconut oil, so maybe don't drink that. So I think what we, what, what you really, what I really, really teaches you to do is to tune into your own body, is to really, really understand your own body so that you're able to see what is dampening your immune system, what is elevating your immune system. And actually with, um, with Ayurveda, I mean, I've shared quite a few tips on, on generic tips that you can do to boost your immunity, but it's not just to do with food. It's to do with the time that you sleep. It's to do with um, a lot of the things that are recommended in Ayurveda. The key thing is talking about prana, pranic foods. Prana means vitality. And so it says that the more vitality, the more life force a, a food has. So for example, when you pick an apple from a tree, that is when it's got the most amount of life. It's just been, it's just got the most amount of nutrients in it. It's the most nutrient dense that it will ever be the moment that it's picked. And then it goes through ships and, and, and um, trains and whatever it is to get to you. And by that point, actually, the life force has diminished quite a fair amount, depending on the heat, the climate that it's been in. So one of the key things I would say for immunity is not even a specific ingredient. It's more to do with have foods that have the most vitality in them, that have the most vibrance in them, the freshest food that you can possibly get wherever you are. Try and base your life about that and keep it simple. You know, all foods have so much in them these days. Like you look at the back of a bread and there's just so many added ingredients. And actually if we simplify it back to 
how nature intended us to eat. Then actually we're nourishing our bodies in a way that's simple and simple to digest and simple to you know allow the nutrients to absorb into our bodies too. The simpler something is, the easier it is to absorb into your body. The less your body has to work at it to actually you know strain the the nutrients from it. So that's, that's so actually cool. my, my immunity advice. Eat, eat the most the vibrant, the the freshest food that you can and it will really help to nourish your body. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> now on your website you have the three pillars. So you have nourish your mind, mind mm -hmm. nourish your body, nourish your soul. Um, which, you know, that all, as you talk about, is the Ayurvedic way. Yeah. Um, within that are your recipes. Mm -hmm. oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my gosh, every time I look at your website, oh, I wonder if she'd ever invite me over for dinner. Oh, you know what? I've got something for you after this. Oh. Don't worry. Oh my gosh, <laughs> stop it right now. So, which is your favorite recipe? Which is my favorite recipe? Honestly, I feel like my, um, the things that I crave really change depending on season. For example, in summer right now, I'm obsessed with anything to do with peaches and berries, like, you know, fruit desserts? Yeah. Obsessed. And I feel like, and salads as well, just fresh, fresh salads. And I actually have realized that whenever I am eating in a way that's most beneficial to my body, it craves the things that are good for it. And so in winter, I'll really crave like kitchri, which is one of my favorite recipes. It's a mix of lentils, vegetables, spices, rice. It's meant to be, in Ayurveda, it's considered like the king of dishes because it says that it's full protein and um, it's a complete protein when you add the rice, lentils, and vegetables together. But it also has the spices in it, which really helps cleanse your digestive system. It, I always I always refer to it as like a hug for your belly. That's mm. genuinely how it feels in winter. Um, but in terms of my favorite dishes, I would have to say Indian food is my favorite. It's mm -hmm. close to my heart. And anything with spices um, and just vibrant colors. In Ayurveda, it talks about how um, actually your digestion starts from the moment you look at food. And so I know a lot of the time people are like, oh, but you know, I, I can't decorate my food like that. And it takes too long. And I always say it's not necessarily about how you decorate it, but getting the balance of different colors that you're, that you're choosing, the different vegetables that you're choosing, the different grains that you're choosing. Actually, if you're looking at it and you're attracted to it, that's when your digestive juices start flowing. So, so attraction to food is so important for you to actually digest food well as well. And I think people forget that sometimes. Wow. Yeah, so spices, colors, anything vibrant. <laughs> I think though, you know, a lot in the um, Western world, you know, and I think in the United States, one of my experiences being like, just when it comes to food, this insatiable appetite for just big and, yeah. you know, and almost not taking that moment. One of the things I really, really, really enjoy is, you know, when you've done your cooking is watching you do your gratitude prayer. <laughs> And, you know, there's not really a lot of that here. So yeah. if I'm hungry, I'm going to eat, boom, gone, you know. Um, so I love that thought process about actually, you know, finding the food, appetizing by looking at it, mm. getting your digestive process started there. Yeah, and you know, when you said that, it reminded me of the reason why a lot of people's appetites increase and why we end up eating large amounts of, of certain food groups is because the nutrient value of a lot of the foods that we're eating are not high. Mm. And so our body's actually craving nutrients. And because they're so diminished in a lot of the foods that we're eating, we l eat larger quantities of them, trying to refuel ourselves. Um, but we have to eat larger amounts of those foods to even get those vitamins and minerals that our body are craving. Um, and then, it, yeah, that just goes back to the, the vital foods, the, mm -hmm. the vibrance and vitality that actually we'd be able to eat. We'd be able to eat a lot better, a lot less, um, because we're getting the, the nourishment that we need for our body if we eat right. Which is a whole new approach to food. It is. You know, because here it's just like I'm hungry so I eat mm -hmm. and I don't want to just, let, you know, sort of put this on the United States. No, Quite no, the same yeah. in England too, yes. you know. And I think it's getting there in India as well. It's oh really? And you know the mindful prayer that you were talking about, I just, I learned about that through my spiritual and Ayurvedic practice, I think they're both quite intertwined and it's all about conscious eating. It's a practice of conscious eating and, and con mindful, a mindful practice to do with cooking as well. And it's, the end of it is the gratitude prayer, but also that consciousness and that mindset is infused throughout the cooking process. 
and it's because it says that the mindset and the energy that you infuse into the food has that possibility to affect your body so cooking with a positive mindset cooking with music that uplifts you that surcharges the the molecules in the food with positive energy that can not only be felt through nourishing your body on a superficial level but also it has that possibility to nourish your soul and your heart too because you know energy is so powerful everything has energy and everything ha absorbs energy and so a lot of the time I say this and I think people must think this is a bit woo woo and you know energy into food and I'm like no that's why a lot of the time we talk about mums cooking because mothers infuse so much love into their mm. food when they're cooking for their children yes they may be great cooks but a lot of the times you end up loving your mom's food even if she's not a good cook because it's your mum and because you know she's put so much love into it and so I think you know that practice of it's also just another way of being present throughout your day it's like we have an opportunity to be present in every single moment, every single thing that we do. So cooking where we're nourishing our bodies, which is actually the most important fuel that we're getting for us to be able to do everything we do during the day, that should be a moment we take a second to really be present with our food, to be present with the people that we're eating it with, to really acknowledge where the foods come from. Like that's the gratitude prayer that I love saying. It's like let's take it all the way back to the person that sold us the groceries, the person that uh, grew them at the farm, uh, the sun for growing it, the water, the clouds, you know, God for providing everything for us. All of that is such an important integral part of us being grateful, but also for us to really appreciate everything that we've been given. And I think that also plays into digestion and, you know, taking, taking small bites while we eat. All of that is all part of a mindful practice to be able to nourish our minds and bodies. I think that's so it, a mindful good. practice. That's a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, it's all about just being having pocket, pockets and moments in your day where you can practice mindfulness. And eating and cooking shouldn't be, you know, separate from that. It doesn't mean you just sit here meditating. Like, that's not what my, mindfulness isn't just for those two hours or 20 minutes that you meditate. It should be a, a lifestyle. It should be a, a way of life. It doesn't just have to be for certain moments in the day. Mm, I love that. And then coming back to the spiritual part, yeah. to your spiritual practice, yeah. and how sort of that's very similar or very infused with Vedic um, tradition, or they, they tie together. So, where did you discover your connection to spirituality in your life, and what inspired you? Um, my mom has always been a huge inspiration for me. She. I've seen her, my grandma and my mom, I've seen them practice their spirituality with so much conviction and faith throughout my life, always. And I think, you know, seeing that whenever I would wake up, my mom was doing her prayers or she was in her meditation. And without fail, there was never a day where I wouldn't wake up and see her do that. And it just showed me the devotion that she had to her practice. But at the same time, I was kind of in a place where I appreciated it because she appreciated it, but I didn't have my own connection to it yet. And there's only so long you can do something because somebody else, like, it gives someone can tell you, this tastes so good, it tastes so good, but until you actually eat it, you have no idea. Yeah. And so in the same way with a spiritual practice, people can keep telling you how good it is, but unless you invest the time into experiencing it and understanding it for yourself, you don't feel it. Like, it's just kind of like a superficial attachment to mm -hmm. it. And so, after um, she was talking about it a lot to me and I did, made a decision that, you know, I really want to know why I do certain things. It was very ritualistic where I did things because other people told me to or other people said it was good for me. And so I just decided to dive deep into it and I started going to a temple that was close to me. And I decided that if I really wanted to understand the meditation practice, I wanted to do exactly how they did. So before work every day for a year and a half, I actually went to the temple at 4.30 in the morning and I would do the meditations there for two hours, go back home, get ready for work and leave for work. And that was my practice for maybe a year and a half. And you know, I don't rec I don't, I'm not saying everybody should do that, but for me what it did was just as we would study intensely for an exam, in the same way for me it was like if I really want to experience this, I need to immerse myself deeply into it just to know whether it's worth it. And by being able to do that, it really once sped up my... By immersing yourself into something, you get the experience so much faster and so much deeper, I feel. That's why I really recommend retreats to people. Because it's like, okay, you could do 10 minutes of meditation every day, or you could go away for five days. Spend five days, or not even go away, sit in your house for five days, and really connect deeply to yourself. Sit with yourself, sit with your own mind, and you can learn so much about yourself. And so that's really where my faith began. 
and I haven't stopped that practice since. You know, I still I built up to it, but I ended up I have a strong meditation practice now where I meditate for an hour and a half in the morning, and. I have to say it's just if I it's the nourishment that I feel I need to be able to give to other people and that's I really love giving to other people and I love being able to share joy with other people but I notice that without that deep foundation and without those roots um, that are that are constantly nourishing me which is through my spiritual practice I'm not able to give to people in the way I want to and so I really make a strong effort to keep my as much as it goes up and down and you know sometimes I can be completely distracted throughout it but it's still there and it's still a practice that I maintain because I know it fuels me to be able to fuel others and I think it's uh, yeah what's well, life without service I think that's the best thing I learned about doing um, in this Vedic culture and in, and in this path that everything is about serving others we get so much more joy in serving other people than we do in taking and whatever we can do to facilitate us being the best version of ourselves to be able to give that best version to other people that's it's just such a beautiful practice such a beautiful meditation to keep throughout your life and to keep growing in that way is yeah i'm still on the journey i'm still trying to figure out to be honest but i love that yeah. i love that and then i saw your birthday post where you talked about talked about in your 30th year you were going to hopefully connect even deeper with you know your most important relationship and yeah. that's with God mm -hmm. what does that mean to you to have a relationship with God yeah good question um, what does it mean to me I believe that we are all in some way part and parcel of God in our energy that we have everything that we are every skill that I have every Everything positive in my life and everything negative in my life has all come from God either as a lesson or for me to be able to utilize it in a way to serve other people. And so my relationship, when I said I want to strengthen my relationship with God, I think I really meant that I need to strengthen my relationship with myself to understand myself better in order to be able to be used as an instrument. It, the use, meditation is often used as, um, there's an analogy given in, in the tradition where it talks about you being a vessel or instrument of God's grace and it's such a beautiful way of thinking about it that the meditation really helps kind of clear the lines clear the reception like imagine you've got really bad reception and meditation really helps to refine that and create a stronger connection so you are able to hear whatever God is trying to tell you but also you're able to be almost like an open instrument and like an open vessel for God to be able to work through you and I think uh, for me, strengthening my meditation practice is definitely one of the goals to be able to connect deeper. But um, yeah, also just to just be in service to others. I think that's something that I'm really focusing on this year. And I think that's the main goal of, of being God conscious or being conscious of spirit or the soul. Um, it's all about it's all about that for me, really. Yeah, uh, I love that. It's so beautiful <laughs> to think about you know being a service. And I think. I'm a little like that too with the magazine because it's yeah. for me, you know, it's really it's about helping our planet, which is our home, and Definitely. helping people and animals that live on it now, but also then children of the future, making mm -hmm. sure that there is um, a home. And I was raised Catholic, mm -hmm. so um, with that teaching, it was very much sort of instilled in me as a child that yeah. you know this isn't this isn't your home, this is God's home yeah. that he's allowed you to come and live on mm -hmm. and whether someone understands or agrees with Catholicism or not. And it's your own faith. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I well I've gone more spiritual now, my yeah. old age, kind of feel a little bit off the Catholic bandwagon, but um, it, it just imparted so many good things Definitely. in me as a child that m really have uh, affected how I view the world mm. um, and my thing is to be in service I'm just naturally in service if I'm not helping the planet then I'm helping a rescue dog if I'm not yeah. helping a rescue dog I'm helping somebody who's sick and if I, I'm constantly and Try, like yeah. in, all my friends are like oh, I'm just such a caretaker yeah that, but it is and it says our natural state for our soul is to be in service and if we're not serving others actually we feel such a void mm -hmm. um, and in giving to others you end up receiving so much more so I really think it's actually it's actually fuel for our soul to be able to give to others and if we're lacking in that and if we're not doing that actually it's it's uh, stalling our progress mm -hmm. 
our, our growth. Yeah, yeah. our growth, our exactly. Our energetic growth as well. Yes. And you have a spiritual teacher. Yes, I do. Okay, tell yeah. me a little bit about... Um, well, his name's Ravana yeah. Swami, yep. and he is... You know, I, I, I was always... Um, very intrigued by spiritual teachers and I don't think he would ever call himself a spiritual teacher I think we've kind of just like we call him our spiritual teacher but he's so humble and he's just so you know there's, there's very few people that you meet where you feel that their whole life is just to help people dedicated your whole entire life he's dedicated 30 years or more of his life to help people connect deeper to themselves to be able to just connect deeper to God and I just think, you know, there's so much beauty and simplicity. He's so simple-minded. He's so humble. There is no part of him that I've ever seen. I've spent a fair amount of time with him, and I've never seen ego. And I think that's that's the point. Sometimes I think, you know, we can always feel like we're spiritual. Mm -hmm. But when you end up actually observing somebody who genuinely is so humble, who genuinely has a heart which is constantly giving, no matter what, whether it's time, energy, effort, there is unlimited amount of fuel in him because he is so surcharged with spiritual energy. And I think you can only tell by people's actions. And it says in, in the Vedas, it talks about how you can tell somebody's really progressing in their spiritual life or is, is um, you know, is enlightened mm -hmm. when their actions, when their mind, body, the tone, and if we get this right, when their word, they they words are spoken with integrity, and integrity means when they are speaking what's actually in their heart. And when somebody does that, it pierces through your heart. It's like sometimes you know when you speak to people and they say, "Oh my goodness, you look so beautiful today," and you can feel in their mind they're saying, "Oh, yeah." Mm -hmm. You know, you can feel the energy is different from mm -hmm. what they're saying and what they're thinking. Whereas with Radhana Swami, what I found was everything that he spoke about would just hit me in my heart so deeply. And I realized it's because he wasn't just talking it, he's living it, he's breathing it, he's, he believes in it so deeply. And um, I've met quite a few spiritual teachers that, that are like that and I feel so grateful to have met them. And I, I just think it's, it's so beautiful. They're very rare souls and to be able to experience that and to be able to just even hear the words that he says, I just think, you know, why, like, why not believe in something so so beautiful? Yeah, why not? It's a gift. Yeah, and, and everybody needs a teacher in something. We need teachers for education. Mm -hmm. We need teachers for driving. We need teachers for everything. Mm -hmm. And so, why it, why should our spiritual life be any different? We need guides who have gone through the process, who have seen what the ups and downs can be, and how to pull pull yourself out of them. And so sometimes I feel the word, you know, gurus are seen as such a, there have been lots of, you know, bad things also associated with a spiritual teacher or a guru. But I just think that whether it's a spiritual teacher or a driving teacher or an education teacher, we need teachers to be, we, we don't know everything. There's no way we can know everything. So you have to go to the experts who have done it. And for me, somebody who's dedicated 30 years of their life to it, I'm sold, and, and until I see a reason not to believe in it, I'm I am fully fully sold on it because it's transformed my life. Wow! Yeah, and the thing about spirituality, anyway, it's sort of for me, it's a never-ending book. It's, always, it's not something, you're always growing. You're always growing, so that's a lifelong commitment to embrace that. Yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. <laughs> All right, so um, your husband. Yes. <laughs> Now, people are very familiar with his story. How has he um, influenced your life and your direction since you've been together? He is, he is someone who has, you know, it's, I feel so lucky to be able to see how he lives day in, day out. I think he, uh, he was a monk before. I don't know whether anybody would have known that, but he was. And I really think that um, that period of his life really molded who he is now. And at first I thought, oh, you know, you can't really be like that all the time. And then I got to spend time with him day in, day out, and I saw, you know, three of, well, one of the, I'll start with one, one of the things that he's really taught me is about equanimity. And it's a quality that is often spoken about in the Vedic culture where it says, we go through so many emotions in our lives, we go through so many ups and downs, um, and usually we try to uh, stay in the ups and we get really excited when we get excited but when there's lows we get so sad and upset and so angry, low. Yeah. so low. And, and life ends up being like this. Exactly. Yeah. And so instead of having emotions that go up and down, it says a strong spiritual faith and a meditation practice can actually help us do this. Where we go through, we maybe go through the same ups and downs but what we're feeling there isn't so many waves, it's more, uh, it's equanimity, it's, it's flow, you kind of flow through it in your mind and, and in your life because you have perspective constantly.
all of that encompassing. So one of the things, and I asked you this at our shoot, cookbook, cooking show? Yes. Because to me it seems obvious. Oh, thank you. Well, I think it's taken me such a long time to actually get to this point of having a website and um, of being able to share my, my recipes with other people. And so, yes, I would love to do a cookbook in the future, but I think, you know, I'm taking it a step at a time. I feel like my personality type is such that I don't like focusing on too many things in one go. And um, it takes me a while to jump over my fears of what the negatives could be of something. So it's taking me two years to make this website, uh, but hopefully it will be a speedier process to move forward to the next. I have been thinking about it and honestly, I just find whatever way I'm able to share the information that has changed my life and transformed my life, if there is any means that is available for me to be able to even reach five more people or like 10 more people or one more person, um, I would definitely take that opportunity because, you know, trying to, what's, I know, I know for a fact that what has transformed me and has changed my life has the opportunity to do that for other people. And I would never want to feel like I didn't share that or make the effort to share that in as many ways as possible because not everybody has access to India or to scriptures and, you know, they don't come across them. Some people know nothing about it. And so, um, yeah, that's definitely my goal to try and reach as many people as I can with the information that I have been lucky enough to receive. Mm, well, I think that you could create a conscious revolution. <laughs> I do. I think you with your that. help, yeah. I think you could let people go vegan. Really, Aww. I think all of a sudden because you know, for just people I've ever spoke will speak to about veganism. Yeah. Um, I've never gone um, completely vegan, and it's lame. It's little things like cheese. Oh yeah. Yeah. But um, so veg vegetarian, I'm great at vegetables. I love. And then when I see your cooking, I'm like, what cheese? Oh, I eat like this. Yes. And I think I'm even it's like so many people just see beyond the. And I know here in, in LA we're very lucky because it's more the vegan restaurants so and stuff. Yeah. But I think in a lot of places they don't understand really the concept of, of being vegan Definitely. and they think they might be missing out. Yeah. And I think you bring to life that no, you're actually gaining, you're not losing. Yeah. You know? Totally. I completely agree. I, uh, I think veganism is can be scary for a lot of people because it's so unknown and such unfamiliar territory. But I do believe that, yeah, the more flavor you, you, so many of my friends come over and they eat and honestly, I feel like it's the flavor that really makes a difference rather than like what's in the food. If you are able to infuse so much flavor into it, make it really hearty, make it just, you know, people will forget that there's no meat and people forget that there's no, um, I think it's all about flavor. I always say this, I'm like, add spices into your life and it will completely transform your cooking. Um, but it's small steps for people. I always, I always recommend to people, maybe if, if you find it too scary, turn to vegetarianism first and then slowly make your way. I never like forcing people into it, but I, I love sharing information to make people a lot more aware of the possibilities. Mm. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. And then finally, few people would know that you are actually quite a talented little designer. Oh! So tell us about your <laughs> the Radhi Samsara Weekend bag. Yeah, um, it's one of my great friends. Her name is Salima. She owns the business Samara. And I had been looking for a vegan weekend bag for such a long time that was cute, sporty, you know, fit my uh, personality. I didn't want anything to um, fashionista, but I also wanted something a bit sporty and you know, that's how I like to dress when I travel. Could not find anything that we, I really loved. And so luckily I met, met Salima and uh, we, she was just like, well, let's create something together. I said, you know what I've been looking for? A weekend of She goes, let's do it. So we started creating it and honestly, I'm so proud of it. It's such a beautiful bag. It's become, it's everything that I would have wanted it to be. Um, it also came with these lovely essential oils that I created that come with the bag um, for travel. So there's Abhyanga oil, which is an Ayurvedic massage oil for you to ground yourself when you get to your destination, but also an essential oil for you to smell during the plane to, re to relieve anxiety. And I really think we infuse so much of everything, a little bit about every part of my life into that bag. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. There are so many amazing colors. And uh, I feel so like proud that it's that it's ours and, and that um, we're able to share it with, with so many people. 
No, it's very stylish. Thank you. Very chic. Thank very you chic. so much. And then your jewelry, your necklace you're wearing at the shoot. Yes, this one. Yes, we are um, hopefully launching this in about a month's time. And it's chrysoprase. Chrysoprase? That's how you say it. Um, and it's, so it's, this, it's this green necklace. And it is to do with opening the heart chakra. So it's meant to be a stone that really helps heal your heart, but also be able to access your feelings, your emotions, to be able to share with other people. And so I always think of it as like the connectivity uh, stone. And I always, I think, like if there's anything that can help me connect to people deeper or anything that can help um, us access our emotions, then I'm so up for it. And so we are creating these to share with the world. Hopefully it should be launched in about a month's time. So, so exciting. So exciting. Anything else? Um, anything else? Um, not that I can think of. Oh, my new website. I'm creating a new website to make it even better for people to access and a little bit more user friendly that should also be launching next uh, next uh, month. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you so much. This was so wonderful. I can't even put into words my gratitude. Oh, me Seriously, too. Seriously, for the whole experience. It's just a blessing it's been and a joy. together. We have so, I mean, the shoot was so wonderful. Um, and this has been so lovely to just sit and chat with you. <laughs> That's why you are. She's September's ray of light. Oh, I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. <laughs> Yay. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>